morning. Today, our word for the day is is. Yes, the word of the day is is. See? I S. Now, what does is mean? Is means, well, I could say, this is an apple. I could say, well, see, this sign, it will point to an apple. Therefore, if the sign says, here is where you will go to maybe find an apple, does that make this sign an apple? Is a sign an apple? Oh, okay. How about a nice picture of an apple? Is the picture of an apple an apple? No. Like the way I can say no. I'm very good at saying no. No. Okay. Uh, what is then? What is an apple? Is an apple a sign pointing to an apple? Is an apple a picture of an apple? No. An apple is an apple. And that is our lesson on is today. And why are we learning this? Because it's very important. Listen, anytime Jesus says, this is, he's not talking about a sign. He's not talking about a picture or symbol or something that represents what is. When Jesus says, this is, he means it is. I hope. You can understand this. Yeah, I, I think we got that. Is, is. I mean, that's, that's pretty simple. Well, good. Okay, well, um, what I have here is some fruity starburst, some fruity Tootsie Pop rolls are some fruit. And you can decide, well, wait, no, they have to decide themselves. Are you going to have the fruity flavored fruits, fruities, or the fruit, or the fruity flavored Starburst? And you can figure out what is is out of all that too, so. Okay, everybody get your selection. Communion, other times Lord's Supper, even Eucharist. I asked that question because just last week, uh, eight of our fifth graders finished instruction in communion. And therefore, they will be joining us later today at the second service uh, of saints and sinners in receiving bread, wine, but also receiving something more. This more, we all need to hear this day many times because we're human and as we go through practices and routine that they become more routine, uh, we sometimes fail to completely grasp again what is happening, what is going on. So what is offered when we have worship practice where we have Holy Communion? Anytime you ask a question, you are probably immediately going into a method that you're quite familiar with from school. Uh, it is intellectually or uh, uh, philosophically called the Socratic method. And this is really how teaching has sort of evolved ever since Socrates, who started this. 
And Socrates was this philosopher, and what he did was ask questions. His point was, as I ask questions, I want you to go deep within yourself to find out what is the answer. Because the answer is somewhere within you. So that if you go deep within yourself, as you delve deeper, you'll find the answer. Socrates, it was always buried in you. And so I, as I ask a question. In the Socratic method, what we are used to hearing is somebody saying, well, I think, while somebody else will say, well, it seems to me, and then yet a third person will go, well, you know, I've always looked upon it like this. And your answer will be true for you, but only for you. Well, before Socrates was, Jesus was. He was the eternal word. Jesus, incarnate on earth, was a great teacher. He was called rabbi. Jesus also used questions, lots of questions. It's interesting to read through the gospel and notice how often Jesus asked questions. But Jesus' questions were never designed to send the listener deep within themselves to discover some truth that resides in the marrow of their bones or in the folds of their brain, but Jesus' questions were always used to set up a tension to reveal to the listener that despite all we know, there is that that we do not know. And therefore, we live insufficient and incomplete. When Jesus asked questions, he would follow it up with the answer. So that Jesus would say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Jesus' questions were always followed by his teaching, a teaching from his words, where he will, giving the answer, declare that this is the truth, for all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Listeners were constantly amazed at the way Jesus taught because he did not teach like their scribes or their Pharisees or anybody that was trained in the Socratic method. Jesus taught with authority. And so back to my question that I began the whole sermon with. We practice something called Holy Communion, but what does it mean? What is it? Well, Jesus says to our very ears, this is my body, this is my blood. Now comes attention. For our eyes see bread and wine. Our investigative curiosity reveals that, well, this is a piece of uh, flour and water that's been pressed and then packaged in a uh, bulk of 500 and sold by some uh, church uh, distribution company. And it's just Manischewitz wine. It comes in the gallon green jug that we get from Lenny down at the only one. Our intellect says, yes, it is purported that Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood, but <coughs> our doubting and rationalistic and searching minds begins to create other explanations or other interpretations on what exactly is means. Back to the children's sermon. Perhaps this word is wasn't really is and Maybe it was a different word in the original language, but we can't find anything there except is. And so then we're left with this dilemma. We hear, but we see with our rationalistic mind something else. We hear, this is my body and this is my blood, but we see, well, nothing like this. What do we do with all of this that we receive? Again, we're told by Jesus, our ears say, eat it, drink it. But 
what we're told to eat and drink is body and blood of Jesus. Now we can be like the people in John's gospel. You know, the 5,000 that are following Jesus because, well, they got free bread. And they're following him. And then Jesus just starts telling you, well, this is what the bread of life is. And he goes right to the heart of the matter. And he says, this is the bread of life. It is my flesh. It is my blood. My flesh for you to eat. My blood for you to drink. Well, by this point, they're getting rather grossed out. I mean, the imagery is cannibalistic. And by the end of it, they are leaving in droves. You, you want to see Jesus drive people away? This is it. He has this huge throng. He drives them all away. And in fact, you know, he keeps doubling down. They keep going, well, what are you talking about? He goes, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, unless you drink his blood, you will have no life in you. His disciples are going, Lord, this is a hard saying. Who can, we can't even listen to this. And they left in droves. And Jesus has to ask the 12 that are left, are you going too? This is my body. This is my blood. Take, eat, take, drink. Yet it even goes on to something that our mind can't grasp there even. He says, you eat and drink for the forgiveness of your sins. Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Or as they memorized, uh, given and poured out for you to forgive the bad things you have done. Now, where is eternal life? Our eyes tell us everyone dies. I mean, well, yeah, grape juice has some benefits, and so does wine have great uh, benefits, and, uh, but pomegranate juice, that's higher in antioxidants, isn't it? Our eyes know what we see, and it's not what our ears are hearing. Jesus is telling us something very different than what our eyes are picking up. Yet Jesus says to our ears again, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him on the last day. Okay, all die, we got that. Everybody's dying. Um, eating and drinking Jesus' body, his blood, uh, we're maybe raised to eternal life. But how is this? Is there something magical going on here about eating some wafer and drinking some wine? Jesus says, no, John 6, 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Eating and drinking is not this main thing. That's occurring. It is the words that we hear are the main thing in this sacrament. Words into our ears to create belief. Words into our ears to create this trust, this assurance that, yes, these words are true. This is most certainly true. For these words are spirit and life. The flesh is of no help at all. What this means is that questions generated within our flesh just send us deeper and deeper and deeper where? Into our very flesh, into our very self for us to try and find some answer. And that is no help at all because the answer does not lie deep within ourself. The answer lies outside ourself in the way, the truth, the life, that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. His words of promise spoken to our ears tell us everything we need to know. And so what the eye cannot see, what the mind cannot grasp, the ears can hear and believe. Which is why every time Christians gather for Holy Communion, 
It is not an opportunity for deep reflection into yourself. Instead, you will hear what the preacher says as she turns around at the altar and says, on a night in which our Lord was betrayed. Notice that. Unlike baptism, it is once done, never repeated baptism. Um, that was it for Paisley Ann. She doesn't get to be baptized anytime she feels like it. Uh, when we receive Holy Communion, well, we're going, who's getting this? Same question in baptism. Who's getting this? Uh, what did Paisley Ann show us today of great moral truth? What did she distribute to us today in terms of great goodness? No, it is not dependent upon us. In fact, if you listen to the words of Holy Communion, who is it given to? On a night in which he was betrayed, and Jesus knows there is going to be a betrayer among him, there is going to be a denier among him, and there are going to be all that turn from him. There's Nobody's going to be standing beside him, fighting to the death, even though they say they will. And Jesus knows exactly who he is giving this to, those who are turning from him. When Jesus institutes Holy Communion, it is to the betrayers, and he gives it to them. He gives it to those who are not going to show their mettle. He's going to give it to sinners. Communion is given to deniers and deserters. Even though we have other intentions, we are all sinners. Again, everything I've been saying here is a tension. It's, 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 an abrasion because our mind can imagine, okay, well, uh, we're good, but uh, our eyes are going to tell us something else. The words we hear of Jesus' law is going to say, no, no, no. And we'll realize exactly who we are. This is why we need to hear. And this is so important. This is why, you know, when you come to church, uh, we're not having you exercise and show off your goodness. We make you just sit and listen. The church is gathered to listen to the word of the Lord. Where again, Jesus says, not, and he says it for all. He gives it all to us, the eyes, the ears, the senses of eating and tasting and drinking. And he says, this is for you given and shed for you, for what? The forgiveness of your sins. We can turn back into ourselves and to our very deep minds and senses, but Jesus pulls us out, and he just gives it to us by his very word. Forgiveness. Well, what did we do to deserve this? No, no, no. Forgiveness. Here it is again. Here. Receive by faith what you are told. For you is forgiveness. Don't listen to what's going on inside your mind and, and what you are hearing from other words. You hear the word of the Lord and it gives you what it promises. Here, eat, drink for the forgiveness of your sins. And that is is a refresher course again and what it is that we do sometimes by routine. But we understand there's nothing routine about it. Amen.